that because of the fact that we have a part of us that seems to be beyond that of the animals, maybe there's a part of us that has come from some other origin. And some people think there is really a celestial origin. And I came across a very interesting theory, um, which essentially builds on Freud's model of the self, but adds on to it. And according to this, the, the part of, there is a part of us, certainly the id, that is of animal origin and really comes about through the process, the biological processes of the body. I guess a bit like Aristotle's views that we discussed earlier. But this ego um, and the superego um, comes from some sort of celestial origin, a bit like Plato's ideas that we discussed earlier. And then in addition to that, if you think about it, how do we explain why people are so interested in and have always been interested in religion or some study of the divine? And so according to this theory, there may be another component called the super id within the human mind or consciousness that is naturally drawn towards something, a sort of supernatural or some being above. And that these two celestial and, and animalistic origin of the being come together to form not only Freud's ideas but also a little bit beyond that. And I think that's interesting because it brings in what we discussed through philosophy as well. So now, I want to go to the last 30 years and look at science very briefly. Now, I've kindly invited Peter to come and explain a bit more about the neuroscience and the self, and then I'm going to finish with a few slides talking about our research. So the problem for science is also, now initially scientists were completely skeptical about this idea of the self or consciousness. To them, this was irrelevant. It was for philosophers. It wasn't something we should be interested in. But thankfully, in the last 30 years or so, scientists have become interested. And here we have a very eminent neuroscientist who's thinking about consciousness, doesn't know how it comes to be. How do our thoughts come to be? He's looking at himself in the mirror. He loves himself. And he's saying, although I'm so beautiful and gorgeous, how do my thoughts come to be? Mm, but I'm not really sure where my thoughts come, to, come from. And the problem is very simple. If you study the brain, if you look at the brain as this amazing gray organ, which we all have, of course, if you break it down from the large scale into, and you can see here on the left, you can see these tracts of nerves that come down. And then if you break it down into an even smaller scale, the individual brain cells, which you can see on the right, we know that brain cells, like any other cell in the body, interact with each other through some chemistry, and they produce a bit of electricity. And they produce proteins like any cell in the body. So the big question is how... If you were to look at a brain cell down a microscope and I were to say to you here, this individual cell that you can see here is actually thinking, God, I'm getting tired or I'm hungry. You say, well, that, that's impossible. It's a cell. How can a cell think? It doesn't make sense to me. So, because cells produce proteins, protein-based structures. So the question then is, how is it that if you connect two cells together with a little bit of electricity or five or a hundred or a million cells or a billion cells together for that matter, where did the thoughts suddenly come from? It doesn't make sense. If I throw a brick at my neighbor's window, why would my brain cells start to feel guilty about what I did? It just doesn't make sense. So that's essentially the problem of consciousness from you know, Plato, Aristotle, till today. We cannot explain. We know it exists. We're all dealing with it every day, but we can't explain it. And certainly science can't explain it yet either. So if you see, as I pointed out, this really originates from thousands of years ago. And then more recently, scientists began to discover that if you stimulate certain parts of the brain, you can get certain actions to take place. So you can map, you can get a geographical map of the brain and identify what parts of the brain are involved with certain processes, including your mind and consciousness. So if you feel happy or sad, you can track which parts of the brain are involved with it. And we do that currently through scanning techniques. You can put people into a brain scanner, and Peter is an expert in this, um, and then you can have them have certain thoughts, and you can see which parts of their brain light up. So here's one example of that. If you see here, there's somebody who's in a scanner, we've sliced through the brain, and as they're having certain thoughts, certain parts of their brain light up. And by light up, what do I mean? I mean that there's more blood flowing into those specific areas that are now orange, and I think it projects orange as well, that are orange. And then when your thoughts change, you see that those orange areas change and different areas become orange. So it tells you there's more blood now flowing into those cells and therefore you can conclude that those areas of the brain are involved with that particular experience that you're having. Now this led some scientists to conclude, oh, there you are then, there's the answer. For example, there's happiness. There it is in that slide. The problem with that though, it makes sense, but the problem with it is that you still haven't explained how the sensation, the feeling of happiness or your thoughts have come about through those cells. All you've shown is that there's more blood flowing into these cells, 
So those cells, activity in those cells, correlate with that aspect of your mind, but it doesn't show how it's being produced. So it's not a causation, it's a correlation. And essentially, if you summarize all the scientific views out there, there's certainly, I have to just tell you, there is no, I was shocked when I learned this many years ago, when I got interested in this area, that there's no theory of, of consciousness that has been proven to be correct, because there's no experimental evidence that supports one or the other. And this has led to a whole different groups of theories of how the mind or consciousness comes to be. And in fact, there's no real plausible biological mechanism even accounted yet. I think if someone does, they'll win the Nobel Prize in five minutes. It, it's a complete mystery. No one, no one understands it. But if you divide the theories up in a very simple way, I've divided them up to conventional and non-conventional views. So the conventional scientific view is that, okay, although we don't understand how consciousness comes to be, it must be produced somewhere from brain cell activity. And that some way, someday we'll discover that. And there are very eminent scientists who support that view. And you may recognize, um, obviously, Susan Greenfield is very famous here in, in, in England, who's professor of uh, pharmaco uh, neuroscience at uh, University of Oxford. And Francis Crick was a co-discoverer of DNA, so a Nobel Prize winner in that camp. Um, but there are others who say that, you know, there are problems. It just, we can't explain it. And so we have to look at it differently. So there are a group of scientists who have tried to study the mind not through the relatively large scale of how brain cells are connected together. And that's, believe me, that's relatively large scale in the scale of the universe. Cells are connected together with a bit of chemicals. You generate electricity, and the electricity goes down. And what they're saying is we can't explain consciousness through electricity because it's completely different. Maybe we have to go to a much smaller level, so from those large structures into molecules, lower down to atoms, lower level of existence in the subatomic world where things behave very bizarrely, the world of quantum physics. And they believe that maybe you can account for the existence of consciousness through some quantum process. Again, there's no evidence that supports it. People who criticize it say that you're just taking the problem from one level to a different level, but you're still not explaining how thoughts come to be. But there are people who support that view. And Roger Penrose is a very famous um, physicist from University of Cambridge who supports that view. There are others who have suggested that, you know, no matter how much we study the mind or consciousness, the problem is it just seems to be so different to every other physical process that we understand. And so maybe we can never really, never really explain it by reducing it down in simpler terms. So maybe we just have to accept that it's just some entity in its own right. In the same way that in physics we say mass. We don't say, let's div what, what is mass made up of? We just consider mass as a separate entity in its own right. And then we build things upon that. And maybe we have to think of consciousness as a separate entity. And there are others who support the idea that actually a bit of a dualist view, a bit like Plato, that um, the mind and Descartes, that the mind and consciousness is essentially a separate, undiscovered scientific entity. It is scientific, it's not magical, but it's not what we understand through our current knowledge of brain cell activity, and we haven't yet discovered it. It's a subtle, very subtle type of matter. And those who support that view, um, Sir John Eccles is very famous. He was a Nobel Prize winner as well.